name is Harold Furchcott Roth, and I'll be your moderator today to discuss a very important topic, receiver standards. Now, if you think this is an NFL topic related to the college football combine, please stay tuned because I think you're going to find this very entertaining today. We have with us Commissioner Nathan Symington of the Federal Communications Commission. Commissioner Symington is one of the brilliant commissioners over at the FCC who is keeping care of a lot of things that are important here in the United States, including looking at questions such as receiver standards. This is a topic that is gaining importance at the FCC as Spectrum becomes ever more valuable. How do we get more out of Spectrum? So please let us welcome Commissioner Symington here to the Center for the Economics of the Internet at the Hudson Institute, who will discuss with us today receiver standards. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner First Scott Roth. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate your kind introduction, and it is an honor to have the opportunity to address the folks at the Hudson Institute, uh, where uh, so many distinguished speakers have preceded me that uh, um, I feel no need to dwell on the um, on the uh, on the venue. So I'm delighted to have the chance to speak with you all today. And as uh, the commissioner has said, I'd like to discuss two topics in particular that my office has been studying that relate to the issue of receiver standards. As we all know well, radio spectrum, including but not limited to suitable 5G spectrum, is severely congested and encumbered under modern conditions. And further spectral densification is not merely expected to occur, but is in fact core to the 5G value proposition. Now, when I say that spectrum is congested and encumbered, to be clear, that's a good thing. It means that we're making more extensive use of wireless communications technologies and revealing more value in doing so. This is a key part of technological and economic advance, and I'm uh, glad to cheer it on. So the, uh, the description as congested and encumbered merely means it with uh, respect to the lighter use that we'd seen in the past. Uh, further, in this age of ransomware attacks, there's an ever uh, greater need for um, increased cybersecurity protections. And there's a specific role, I believe, for the FCC to play in looking at the signal side of cybersecurity. So I believe that taking a close look at how receiver and physical device security standards um, can be improved at the FCC will help us to find pr uh, precise solutions to these issues and uh, help the nation as we move forward into an era of increased technological development in this area. So with regard to receiver standards, I believe that such standards could prove very useful in allowing for more efficient use of spectrum in bands where there's a need to protect or coordinate against in-band interference with incumbents in the band, or in bands where there's currently a large guard band in place to protect operators in adjacent bands. Most receivers, other than aeronautical receivers, do not have an emissions mask. Uh, one possible consequence of this is to permit sp uh, spurious emissions that contribute to intermodulation interference, which is an undesired combining of several signals in a given device, producing new unwanted frequencies that cause interference in the re receiver or an adjacent receiver. So as a practical example of such interference under the present uh, international spectrum regulation regime, a farm equipment provider has informed us that several of their tractors are experiencing such interference from adjacent 4G LTE devices in certain bounds in Europe and Brazil. Uh, this I think speaks to the larger question of what happens when we deploy more and more wireless transmitters and receivers and we have a greater volume of more complex traffic uh, over their topology, thus leading to the question of whether receiver standards that were perfectly adequate in the past and were not overbuilt and were completely appropriate to their environments will continue to be appropriate going forward and to ask the question of how to better coordinate in this area. We apply emissions mask rules across the board to transmitters, but having them apply to both the transmitter and receiver ends may allow for further spectral efficiency especially considering that intermodulation inter interference is only mitigated by distance and power at the transmitter level. The transmitter who is responsible for emitting the signal and is the party currently regulated can't comply with, uh, with an intermodulation prevention regime other than by agreeing to operate below its otherwise approved parameters. So this is an example of how regulatory action or voluntary industry standards could begin to address this issue that's sure to increase in importance in the years ahead. My office has thought hard about whether it makes sense to initiate a proceeding, um, or at least a notice of inquiry, on receiver standards in certain bands. This would seek comment on and hopefully encourage industry to create voluntary best practices 
for receivers operating in keyed bounds. And I want to make it clear that this would be a process of dialogue. This is, um, I think many people in the uh, radio equipment space would be worried that the FCC would prejudge the issue and then start imposing standards on them regardless of whether those are well adapted to their circumstances or to the real problems facing operators um, in those bounds. But um, it may be that in many cases, the best solution uh, at the regulatory level is simply not to regulate at all. But in cases where, um, in cases where uh, the regulator can serve as a coordinator, then I think we um, have a clear role to play. So before any such step, um, my office has concluded that it would probably be a better idea for the FCC's Technological Advisory Committee to take a close look at applying receiver standards in the context of achieving spectral efficiency in congested bands and see what kinds of recommendations come out of that process. And it goes without saying, we believe that industry and trade associations should take center stage in order to collectively address the issue before it rises to the level of attracting national and official attention. And we feel that, uh, that by taking this approach and initiating this conversation, it may be possible to completely avoid the regulatory question at all while still moving forward. Another concern of mine is ensuring that we harden wireless devices and equipment against physical layer attacks. So as, as an example, uh, there, have been, uh, there have been recent hacks where uh, otherwise secure platforms have been attacked by the injection of additional uh, signal packets into existing signal streams. So it's not enough for the device that is being attacked to be well coded or to be secure on its own terms. The device would need, so to speak, an immune system for addressing, um, well, for addressing a digital infection, although not a computer virus. Uh, cybersecurity risks, such as recent ransomware at attacks are not unique to wireless networks and are likely to be addressed by agencies other than the, the FCC. However, uh, I think our role comes in when we look at wireless networks in, in that in being inherently open to attacks in ways that wired networks are not. And as such, the FCC might play a role in developing a solution for new and emerging technologies, such as industrial IoT devices, automated traffic control, and implanted medical devices, which call out for enhanced security because of their vital functions. Or to put it in plainer language, if someone's capable of injecting malicious bits into a bitstream that's being transmitted to a, a regular wireless device, one asks what happens when there's a similar attack uh, based on physical proximity and knowledge of the device on an implanted insulin pump. We're no longer talking about consumer devices, but vital infrastructure, and in some cases, foundational public goods, um, uh, foundational elements of national infrastructure, whether that's fuel transmission, electrical transmission, whether that's railroad operation, um, anything that is introducing wireless technologies in order to fully benefit from the transition to more advanced wireless technologies has to pay new attention to the physical security front. So uh, the role of the FCC comes in here because addressing physical layer security is fundamental to the FCC's role in spectrum management and is outside the competence of other regulatory agencies that are more focused on what happens with uh, signals and provenance of equipment within the device as opposed to over the air. Um, and we might think about spoofing, jamming, sniffing, unauthorized interception, replay attacks, a wide variety of tools that have been used by signal hackers since uh, radio began, but raising to uh, a higher level of urgency given the dependence of vital infrastructure upon wireless technologies. So in this space, the FCC, what, whatever rules it may make would have to operate in close coordination with agencies such as NIST, DHS, and CISA. One possible avenue for enhancing enforcement capabilities then is to look closely at the role of RF fingerprinting. RF fingerprinting allows the identification of a cellular phone or any other radio transmitter by the unique physical characteristics of that particular instance of that device. Um, so just as, uh, just as two people might write the same letter, um, and, which is identical as to each letter and word and each piece of punctuation, but which differs in the handwriting, RF fingerprinting could allow us to identify devices and not merely types of devices. Um, as such, that would make it possible to identify a wireless device by its radio transmission characteristics that are specific to that device and allow for specific signals and specific attacks to, in some cases, be tied to specific devices, thus greatly enhancing enforcement capabilities. And we feel that working with industry to identify uh, possible standards on methods for RF fingerprinting uh, may lead to, on the one hand, recognition of technical limitations, 
On, on the other hand, rolling in of technological advances uh, so that they percolate through industry faster and thus to rapid propagation of best practices within the limits of what's available as well as potentially inspiring uh, further research. I might argue that if 5G wouldn't be a success in industrial applications unless and until we can deliver completely credible security for these new networks. This is in no way a criticism of any present security efforts or, um, and it's not to imply that anything has been done wrong. Rather, my intention in saying all this is to shine a light on the increase in the attack surface that is intrinsic to making wireless technologies pervasive in our lives and thereby enabling continuing growth and innovation. Uh, much of the appeal of 5G is that it goes beyond just having a better phone in your pocket. 5G technologies uh, uh, in the general sense also provide significant potential for uh, increased industrial innovation, in increased productivity, superior logistics, and greater public safety. The flip side of this is that a wired technology is intrinsically harder to hack than a wireless technology because it re relies on a wire. Whereas with a wireless technology, you're, you're broadcasting, you're, you're receiving broadcasts. So it's, um, so it's you, you need a little bit more resistance maybe than some systems have been built with. You need enforcement mechanisms and you need to think about the effects of uh, this pervasive uh, higher use of high energy signals in ways that will not interfere with one another. So now that I've gone on, I'd really, really love for everyone to kick the tires on some of this. Tell me what you're worried about when I, when I say these things. Tell me about shortcomings in my ideation. Help me figure out what the best approach is for achieving these goals. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was candidly quite brilliant. Uh, uh, this is a, a very detailed description you've given of uh, a problem uh, and very much uh, not just a uh, uh, spectrum management problem, but a national security problem. Uh, working its way through Congress right now is uh, legislation uh, that uh, addresses part of a national security problem. Uh, uh, and uh, concern about uh, location of chip manufacturing uh, and Congress is considering spending very large sums of money to, uh, to address this problem. Uh, what you have identified is uh, arguably uh, uh, an even greater vulnerability uh, in the United States for, for wireless networks and wireless devices. Um, uh, has have you had any conversations with uh, with anyone on Capitol Hill about uh, about your ideas about uh, receiver standards and what might be done there? Uh, thanks very much, Commissioner. Um, it's uh, now is indeed a bracing time for national security um, in general. My uh, before going to Capitol Hill with this, I think it's important that I uh, that I raise the issue. Um, with, uh, with the parties who are likely to be concerned with, uh, with implementing it and charged with implementing it. Um, I would like to have a fully baked proposal that has significant industry and trade association input before I talk to anyone on Capitol Hill, um, in part, if nothing else, to, to uh, protect Capitol Hill from having to do all of its own due diligence in this area. Um, if they're to trust us as an expert regulatory agency, then it really behooves us to be experts. And I think part of having expertise in this area is going out and consulting very, very extensively with parties who are likely to be affected by any actions in this area. So the short answer is no. Um, that's, uh, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm prior to the stage of taking something to the Hill. Um, this is also, this, there's also, I think, an iterative process where after consultation with industry, I would bring that back within the walls of the commission. Uh, for discussion both at the uh, both at the bureau and office level and then also at the commission level so that we can settle on a position as an agency that's fully reflective of everything that we've learned and I think maybe at that point it would make more sense to um, to go to Congress with whatever findings we've uh, we're confident in I understand that the commission has a great deal of um, both uh, authority and experience in setting receiver standards and for specific devices, particularly broadcast devices over the decades. Um, uh, can you discuss uh, issues of uh, statutory authority that the commission may or may not have to implement some of the ideas that you've just discussed? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I think um, before I get to the statutory question, although I'll address that directly in a moment, 
Um, I'd like to comment that if, uh, if industry has heretofore decided that receiver standards, um, although they may have had various advantages, would have had costs that outweighed the benefits or would have been outside of commissions, uh, the commission's authority on various points, then uh, I want to respect that. Um, and I, I'm not generally coming from a, a viewpoint of regulation for the sake of regulation. So for example, I've, uh, I've heard it argued that superior uh, TV receiver standards in the 1970s could have allowed for a wider range of TV channels at that time on substantially similar equipment at lower cost. I'm not sure it would have been the commission's role to make that determination and impose, uh, impose that upon the manufacturers. And to a certain de degree, that's a negotiation among the manufacturers, among the broadcasters. Um, and, and that's why I didn't want to lead with the, the question of regulation, um, precisely because I think par as part of identifying the likely economic gains to any activity, we have to figure out what all the consequences uh, are likely to be and figure out how all of the players um, bring their intelligence to bear on the question. But as to whether there is regulatory authority, um, I think the last time the commission really took this up was, um, was an NOI in 2003 that included a discussion of the authority upon which the FCC could have based its jurisdiction at that time. I don't think that's it's substantially changed because the NOI pointed to the FCC's general Title III authority to manage interference, specifically uh, sections 301, 302A, 30, and 303A, E, F, and R. So um, in particular, the language of section 302A gives the FCC the authority to establish minimum performance standards for home electronic equipment and systems to reduce their susceptibility to interference from radio frequency energy. And I note home electronic equipment and systems is in a way almost the reverse of the point that I've been, uh, that I've been making earlier, that many of the areas of concern here are going to be industrial um, or related to public safety or some other non-consumer or non-directly consumer facing use. So, um, so I think it's a, uh, so I think there's um, there's some basis for authority here, um, and I think that as we engage in more findings, a potential basis for authority will begin to emerge in, in more detail based on what those findings look like and based on what industry tells us. Uh, a lot of standards are, are set by uh, various industry-based standard setting bodies, such as IEEE. Uh, what do you uh, would you see as the role of these uh, uh, industry bodies and, and have they in fact uh, set industry standards for receivers uh, that which are not really part of FCC rules? Uh, well, well, yes. Um, the, uh, this, is, this is precisely why we would want to engage with private standard settings bodies as, as part of the consultative process. So, um, and you know, as, as noted, there are, there are receiver standards or there are generally accepted receiver practices um, in, a number of, in a number of areas. Um, and, um, and, and so this, this is really just a, a question of um, what the relationship between the standard setting bodies, the, the affected players and the commission would be. Um, so I, again, it's, it's not a matter of uh, necessarily imposing anything so much as it is going out, seeing what the consultative process looks like. Maybe on a forward looking basis, it looks uh, sort of like the TCBs where we've got third parties that are engaging in determinations that receiver standards are generally adequate um, as far as the standard practices of that industry or are within accepted parameters. And at that point, um, at that point there's, um, I think we've advanced the ball, we've involved industry in these decisions, and we've all, but we've also raised the question of whether there are, for example, some corners of, um, of a sector that have not advanced and uh, that are thus forcing an inappropriate guard band on the rest, we turn it into a negotiation and uh, just have, take a fresh look at it. Uh, Commissioner, of course, there, uh, there's a global market for equipment, uh, both for transmitters and receivers. So uh, there presumably would have to be uh, some international coordination on uh, this as well. We in the United States can't quite uh, do this entirely on our own. Um, uh, any thoughts on uh, international coordination? Yes, absolutely. It's it's um, it's absolutely vital. I've already cited examples abroad, and I think that's that's uh, that's paradigmatic of uh, of what we would expect on this moving forward. Um, we need buy-in from other countries, particularly in the industrial IoT space, for example, where globally harmonized spectrum bands that provide for industrial IoT operations across jurisdictions um, are even more, even more are uh, ever more scarce, and therefore. 
um, in need of standards that encourage spectral efficiency. But, um, but you're, you're completely right, we can't go it alone. Doing so would undercut our international position and would, uh, and would frankly minimize the benefits from improved receiver standards, much of, much of which would uh, ultimately lie in improved international coordination. Uh, from an economic perspective, if Spectrum were, uh, were private property, uh, uh, one would expect that owners uh, of uh, Spectrum would, uh, frankly, would have done this already, <laughs> just to improve uh, spectral efficiency. Uh, the absence of standards seems to, uh, to lead to uh, uh, a, a great inefficiency in the use of uh, Spectrum. Um, and so to me, this is very much of, a, of an economic issue as well as an engineering issue. Uh, have you had any thoughts about uh, engaging the economic community on this? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and first of all, I, I, you're, um, I want to uh, violently agree with your point that, uh, that exclusively licensed spectrum, uh, which is, I guess, as close as we get to fully private property spectrum, uh, is being very, very efficient, efficiently used these days. And that's because of the incentive structure. Um, if you if you look at traffic over um, over licensed uh, spectrum over the past decade, uh, particularly for for example in uh, commercial mobile phones, uh, the spectral uh, the, the increase in traffic is you know is is very very high, and this points to increased spectral efficiency um, being demanded by carriers, being uh, spec'd by OEMs, being provided by component manufacturers and vendors. And so, uh, and so this is a case where uh, the incentive to get the most mileage possible out of the private resource uh, has manifested in great efficiency of use. Now, as to the question of, um, of efficiency in spectrum that is not owned, uh, so for example, unlicensed uh, spectrum, in the case of unlicensed spectrum, I have to say, and probably heavy users of unlicensed spectrum would agree, that the spectral efficiency incentives don't cut quite as hard as they do on, um, in the world of fully licensed spectrum. Now, in, in the case of unlicensed spectrum, sometimes there's simply no appropriate party to hold the license, or by its nature, the usage is international. And so, um, so there are questions of, how, of what an ownership structure would look like, and how it would be enforced, and it, it, becomes, um, it becomes challenging to bring some of this to bear. None of this is to prejudge the question of whether any particular use should be licensed or unlicensed. That's a little deeper than I'm able to get in today's uh, economic discussion. But, um, but I think there, there is a point here that if we're holding spectrum off the market for unlicensed users, then it raises the question of whether those unlicensed users will be able to expect in perpetuity that that spectrum will forever remain off the market. Uh, of course, there's a, a little bit of an ultimatum game going on because licensing that spectrum would break currently on uh, devices that are reliant on its current uh, unlicensed use and perhaps have, have other consequences as well. But, uh, but nevertheless, um, any user of unlicensed spectrum has got to be thinking about the question of whether there will be further incursions on their spectrum from licensed spectrum. Now, the commission has, has freed up spectrum in both uh, licensed and unlicensed uses in recent years, and I don't think unlicensed users uh, ought to have too much to worry about at present. But increased spectral efficiency also will allow for more effective interoperation, and not to, it will also make your own device more secure. So if your receivers aren't being blown out whenever some whenever a a, some, a, 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 a device in proximity, I'm sorry, phones home, then um, then that's presumably something that you can advertise as one of the virtues of your product. And perhaps one day we will see licensing regimes, voluntary licensing and participation or certification regimes, where uh, where devices come with a spectral efficiency um, designation and assurance of quality just in the same way that they might have a DOC as a food product or an energy, energy star certification if, uh, if a computer device. So um, perhaps ultimately the right economic answer here is computer choice, I'm sorry, consumer choice. You say that uh, you say you've got the most spectrally efficient device and maybe that becomes uh, a benefit when your device, but not your competitors uh, becomes immune to um, high powered exclusive licenses that are in close proximity. I can see how, um, to me, some of the challenges emerge in a transition world where you have an installed base of millions or tens or hundreds of millions of devices that don't meet a particularly high receiver standard. 
uh, in going from that world, which we're in today, to a world in which there are receiver standards and you can uh, have much more efficient uh, usage of the spectrum. Um, uh, can you discuss a bit about how you see uh, transitions going? Uh, uh, I mean, one example is uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago on the broadcast side, the, the commission gave incentives for people to sort of turn off their old uh, television receivers uh, and uh, move to, uh, to a digital world. Um, uh, but that's a finite number of devices and fairly high value devices. How do you see this working in, uh, 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 with different types of devices that, uh, that may almost be ubiquitous today? How, how do we transition to a world of uh, uh, receiver standards? Well, Commissioner, that is indeed very much the point. Um, that, is, that, is, that is absolutely on point. We are, we are exiting an era, generally speaking, of greenfield construction and moving into an era of pervasive brownfield construction. Um, the other side of that is that sometimes brownfield sites are very desirable. I mean, that's, that's Rome, that's Paris, that's London, uh, the, really, that's New York City now, um, a place where you have uh, extensive infrastructure already in place and you have to figure out how to live with it. Um, and you have to take its maintenance, its demolition cost, um, buy out of any associated rights in just into the equation as part of any sort of progress that you want to make. So um, I guess what I would say is um, I would, first of all, very much expect FCC rules, if any, on this area to be perspective, just as I would expect industry standards to be perspective. And then um, and then when we look at look back at the installed base, I think it again becomes a question of what are the what are the harms, what are the costs, et cetera, of superannuating a device or a class of devices. Um, at this point, uh, at this point, a lot of devices that were once cutting edge have now been um, have now been scrapped. Uh, hopefully, they've been recycled and broken down into their component parts and the gold and rare earths reclaimed and whatnot. Although obviously that doesn't happen as much as we would like. Um, but I think we would look at it as the new standards aiding in the culling of old devices on the market over time. Um, consumer level devices where tech changes the fastest also tend to be the cheapest built devices for various reasons. So, um, so we might not be any more concerned about this um, after a certain point than we would be concerned that uh, 2007 iPhone doesn't work anymore on modern, um, on modern licensed uh, uh, wireless infrastructure, right? So. So the question would the question would be what's an what's an acceptable rate to all parties given the cost and given the anticipated economic benefits of greater coordination of a process of superannuation and a negotiation with all stakeholders in this to help come to a mutually beneficial outcome. So uh, you mentioned specifically um, incentive incentives. Obviously, there could be federal incentives if there was a, a sufficient federal interest uh, discovered and uh, we were to conclude that that was the right approach. Uh, the FCC has taken, I think, a, a very broad view of what incentives uh, are viable. Um, for example, there were a lot of questions about the incentive structure in the C-band auction, but I think those were vindicated by the extremely high value that was realized in the C-band auction. Um, and uh, and, and it would, you know, the, the incentives were relatively small in comparison to the great desire of new market entrants to license that spectrum. So, uh, there may be industry-centric incentives, there may be federal level incentives, or it simply may be a matter of, um, of consumer-driven incentives where consumers find themselves desiring devices that are increasingly assured against interferences, or we maybe just even redefined baseline consumer acceptable performance as having uh, high receiver standards in an era of spectral densification. You know, if there are two competing brands of router, uh, one has uh, uh, you know, one, ha one has good performance characteristics, the other one has bad performance characteristics, and you have ISPs white labeling them, then ISPs are very, you know, are, are going, are, uh, consumer complaints can be expensive, right? And they, they lead to people switching service, they're not so good. Those routers, I would imagine, would drop off. Similarly, um, similarly, if there are automotive GPSs, or if there are, um, there are personal devices, whether it's on the level of garage door openers or uh, laptop computers, whatever it may be, where receivers are an impediment to getting to the highest performance, I think consumers have shown that there is only so cheap that they're willing to go. And, um, and that may be all the incentive that manufacturers need to put, uh, that OEMs need to put pressure on their component vendors um, and to lead to new standards. 
Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of examples that kind of went the other way, though, where uh, there were licenses, the FCC had license bans, and uh, there, there developed kind of uh, ubiquitous unlicensed devices in those bands. Uh, and arguably, there may have been a higher value use in a license use, but it was just uh, very difficult given the billions of <laughs> incumbent devices. I'm thinking of particularly 900 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, uh, so sequencing matters and, and installed base matters. Uh, but I think what you're pointing out is actually a very, very interesting paradigm, which I don't think really came up very much in those proceedings, which is, you know, suppose a, a licensee comes to the commission and says, we think this spectrum, this spectrum band is really valuable uh, in the following use uh, with uh, certain receiver standards uh, and uh, uh, we're willing to uh, uh, engage with the commission to figure out a way to make this work. Uh, and it's only gonna work with these receiver standards. Um, uh, so I, I think you may be addressing something that could open up uh, a lot of spectrum that's probably underutilized today in, in some some meaning of the word to uh, uh, to greater uses. Uh, so uh, you may be uh, uh, encouraging uh, licensees or would be licensees, people who see a, a rather fallow band of spectrum to sort of say, well, you know, if we only had better receiver standards, we could actually make a great deal of use out of the spectrum. Commissioner, I think that's, um, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting, uh, it's a very in interesting perspective on this. And I note that this goes a little bit beyond even the question of, uh, for example, the FCC mandating receiver, receiver standards to a manufacturer and more makes receiver standards, for example, part of a proposed band plan that would be part and parcel of converting that spectrum to licensed. And um, all I can say is I think that's really exciting territory to explore and I would encourage anyone with ideas in this area uh, to speak to my office about it because uh, if there is genuine interest there um, or if people are you know able to put something together that's a value proposition I agree that there are bands that are underutilized and that might be an entirely novel way for the commission to explore uh, band commercialization. Uh, we've discussed a little bit about the overlap between licensed and unlicensed spectrum. Of course, spectrum management in the United States and globally is incredibly complex. There are very few bands that are purely licensed and very few that are purely unlicensed. And then there's uh, uh, overlay in the United States between federal and non-federal users. And so if you look at a, a band plant in the United States, uh, it's, it's very, it's a complex uh, rainbow of colors there. Um, uh, and uh, these issues of receiver standards are an issue not just for the FCC for licensed and unlicensed devices, but but also for for federal users and internationally for uh, other uh, other countries as well. Um, and so, to some extent, receiver standards may touch on another issue that's very very hot at the commission right now, which is uh, spectrum policy coordination, if you will, between the FCC and NTIA, and of course, in uh, your your previous position, you were at NTIA, and you've you've seen this now on both sides. Uh, uh, how do you see um, uh, uh, receiver standards fitting into questions of uh, spectrum coordination uh, between the administration and the FCC? Uh, you are right. That is uh, that is very much a live question right now. I guess I would say um, that I expect it to increase complexity. Um, on the other hand, I think this is a desirable increase in, comple in complexity because the availability of receiver standards as a domain of discussion, um, just as you pointed out a, a few minutes ago, as, uh, as far as opening up additional, um, additional space for licensees to propose um, usages in, I think it also opens up space for discussion of coordination. So for example, um, if we were to have a band that has a certain incumbent federal user that has uh, certain usage requirements, and the question becomes, as it so often has been these days, how can commercial uh, activity be accommodated on that band, then, um, of course, any commercial operator planning to operate in that band already has uh, the, the receiver standards 
um, that under which they'll plan to operate in mind, but it's perhaps not foregrounded uh, to the degree that we're foregrounding contour and power level um, coordination databases and all the other familiar artifacts of federal and, uh, and commercial coordination. So I guess what I would say is if we are able to foreground and problematize, to use some jargon, um, the, the receiver standards question, then this might be a different avenue under which a prospective operator could initiate conversations with its vendor and OEM. And I might add, if standards are generally rising, then uh, commercial operators would have more options in those areas. So I view it as an opportunity to do federal and commercial coordination better. And then on the federal side, I also view it as an opportunity to, you know, as, as, uh, as you know, very often federal operational requirements and parameters are not necessarily prioritizing spectral efficiency because there are other mission specific requirements uh, such as reliability or, um, or uh, coordination with other equipment or international coordination that, um, that, are, uh, that wind up being more important in the immediate decision making. But again, if once we foregrounded this issue and we've increased the repertoire of spectral efficiency options to the federal government, um, perhaps at that point, the federal government is, would be able to, without compromising on spectral efficiency, nonetheless work towards more effective coordination with, uh, with the commercial sector. Now, as to how that would play out in practice, I would imagine that it would be extremely involved and would involve a lot of back and forth between the FCC, the NTIA, and by the NTIA, uh, the, the entire alphabet of federal agencies. But I, for one, would welcome that engagement because that would mean that we're better serving the American public um, on, uh, on both the public goods that the federal government is, um, is, uh, is providing for the American people, and then also that we're uh, providing a wider array of options um, and a, better, a bigger operational space for commercial um, and industrial uses to uh, play around the edges of that and find ways to coexist with the federal government or to more efficiently use spectrum that is available to both. In your opening comments, you discussed, uh, uh, you mentioned correctly that uh, wireless networks are easier to hack than uh, wired networks. Uh, and, and yet we're seeing a lot of uh, federal focus on uh, security of uh, network equipment uh, particularly the question of, uh, let's say, Huawei and ZTE equipment coming from, from China, and uh, to some extent, the ease with which that equipment can be hacked for uh, uh, harmful purposes. Um, uh, and yet you, you point out that uh, wireless services uh, uh, are, are, to some extent, more easily hacked than, uh, than, than wired equipment. Um, uh, with that, uh, you know, obviously, I don't want to discuss any classified information, but can you just give a, a, a few examples for our audience of uh, how uh, uh, wireless can easily be, be hacked uh, without better uh, receiver standards? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I think when we talk about wireless as well, it's, it's important to note that. Um, that, that, in, that when we talk about wireless, we're really talking about any uh, sort of communication or signal that's taking place over the air. So in some cases, it's not necessarily the type of device to device transmission um, that we're often thinking about when in, in hacking scenarios, although those are certainly out there as well. So one example that, um, that, really, uh, that really made me think actually was, um, was a GPS uh, signal suppression that took place at the Newark airport in uh, 2012 or 2013. And the, this was a case that involved an airport worker uh, installing a GPS uh, signal suppression device in his pickup truck so that his supervisor couldn't track his location. And uh, it's one of these things where the technology proved a little bit more powerful than anticipated and didn't merely blanket his location, but disrupted uh, GPS uh, across a swath of the airport. And you know, as you might imagine, this led to significant public safety concerns and I think effective mitigation took place, but uh, it's a very alarming thing to uh, have out there as uh, a potential action in the repertoire. So that's, that's, a, that's one example of a physical layer attack um, that's independent of the, uh, of the hacking and signals intelligence that's uh, a little bit of a focus on 
uh, on foreign sourced equipment. And it's also distinct from, uh, from what I might call an uncomputer attack, such as a, you know, a phishing email being used to penetrate someone's system. Instead, it's actually you know, suppression of a delicate physical signal that's necessary that we've become reliant upon for basic operations, you know, in my case, and uh, driving around Northern Virginia since, uh, since I'm a recent relocation. You know. um, to, or, or for another example of something, um, something creepy that's more like the tr more traditional IT types of, pres of uh, penetration, there's, um, there have recently been a number of hacks on different types of uh, Bluetooth stacks. Um, one of the most notorious being the, being the, the so-called bleeding bit attack, under which it was uh, demonstrated that it's possible to inject data into a device, um, even if the device is not trying to pair and even if the device in some cases isn't turned on, so long as the device is Bluetooth enabled. Um, and by, uh, by engaging in such an injection, if you really know what you're doing, you can deactivate security uh, controls on the device and run arbitrary code on it. So this is again, another example of a physical layer attack, a, a device that's well programmed and that's secure and that's successfully keeping out most forms of intrusion, um, including quite advanced hacking is nevertheless vulnerable at the level of this kind of signals injection. And something I might note in connection with this is that very often manufacturers of finished products will buy, um, will buy their Bluetooth chips or other components off the shelf as, as black boxes. That is, they're designing their, um, they're designing their equipment on reasonable reliance that the, that the component that they've selected is secure and is not going to be a vulnerability to their system. But you know, it doesn't matter how well the rest of your system is designed. If you buy, um, if you buy a, a, if you can have the most secure house in the world, and if you have a defective deadbolt that seems to, you know, that seems to secure your front door but does not actually do so, then you know, someone can just walk right in. This isn't to particularly pick on the Bluetooth industry. That's the, the, this is just one example of many, type, many different types of signal vulnerabilities. And I frankly don't know what the answer is on this front. Um, which is part of why I'm welcoming industry engagement on that. So that's the GPS hack, uh, bleeding bit. And then, um, and then as another example, um, there was recently, uh, well, recently, a few years ago, a, a signals attack on uh, the emergency warning system on, in a Texas city that set off uh, sirens throughout the city. And in this case, this was, I believe, a fairly old analog system that didn't do a lot of, uh, that didn't have a lot of on alarm IT at all. It was just a matter of finding the right signal to broadcast in the right way. And then you could set off these alarms. Now, these alarms were, of course, technologically innovative at the time that they went in. But there's also, um, there's also a period where eventually it ages out and the technology to address it becomes cheaper. And uh, throughout our national infrastructure, we have some things that are cutting edge some things that we think are highest security, but have, unre but have uh, concealed insecurities. And then we have some systems that are just old and that uh, were secure when installed, but technology has since evolved. Or in some cases, it just became cheaper to hack them. I mean, you can buy high quality pineapples, which are famous from the Silicon Valley show, if anyone's seen that. Um, you can buy high quality pineapples for a few hundred dollars now. And if you know what you're doing, you can use them to pull um, login attempts and th thus passwords off of corporate networks. There are, a variety of, of, uh, there are a variety of wireless threat surfaces. And I guess what I would say is, um, just as you didn't have gasoline explosions before you had uh, private automobiles, nonetheless, we want private automobiles. And I think we want, um, I think we want advanced analytics um, on device all the time. I think we want advanced connections between devices. I think we want advanced public safety and, and security apparatus. I think we want all the benefits of advanced wireless networking, and including those that we haven't anticipated yet. As against that, it also includes accepting an expansion of, of threat surface. You know, very, very few people were ever involved in a collision with a combined speed of 100 miles an hour prior to pervasive use of, uh, of automobiles. And that's something that we've had to, we had to completely redesign our physical infrastructure in order to accommodate. I mean, just you know, drive around DC, it was a sort of a city built for the horse in some ways. And, um, and it, we needed new technologies, whether those, were, um, whether those were new road building technologies, whether that was the entire concept of the interstate, the bypass, the cloverleaf, et cetera, in order to accommodate ourselves to the new technological possibilities and protect ourselves from threats that didn't prior exist in order to reap the full benefits. And I would say that this is analogous, that this is, 
Um, despite the expanded threat surface, there's also greatly expanded opportunity. And that's precisely why we want to be forward looking on the threat uh, in the threat space so that we can make the take full advantage of the opportunities that our um, technological innovators are busy creating. Commissioner, I'm just looking at the list of examples you gave, uh, GPS, Bluetooth, uh, emergency warning system. Um, uh, all of these are, well, at least the first two are definitely not licensed to uh, individual entities. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the license structure for EWS, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, a, a lot of the problems with receiver standards very well may be on uh, uh, areas where there isn't a licensee, and so the the need for efficiency on the receiver may not be as great. But I, I suspect there are examples uh, in the license space as well. The one that immediately comes to mind to me is uh, uh, the uh, fake uh, fake cell sites around Washington D.C. that have been used for espionage uh, uh, to uh, collect. Uh, 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 network uh, wireless conversations, if you will, and mm -hmm. other data. Uh, and, and these are on licensed networks. Uh, it, it, so, but, but there, at least, I think you would, you would have the, the licensees would have very strong incentives to improve their receiver standards, to uh, put in uh, filtering and security mechanisms to uh, prevent this, this type of hacking that, uh, that's gone on. Uh, could you discuss a little bit about uh, the license side as well? Uh, other examples you might have in mind? Yes, absolutely. So as far as um, as far as uh, licensed uses and the you know the implications of these three relating ideas of on the one hand RF fingerprinting to enable enforcement, tighter receiver standards to increase performance, and the general question of physical security in an age of uh, black box components. Um, I, my, my heart goes out to the licensed users because uh, enormous capital investments are being required um, with, a, with drumbeat regularity in some cases in order to continue um, building out uh, infrastructure that, uh, that seems to have almost unbounded demand at present. And with any sort of rapid build out, there's always, uh, there's always a tension between, um, between meaningful security and mere I guess what you would call safetyism, the desire, um, the desire to get beyond what's reasonable in terms of, of security. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge anyone's trade-offs in that space. I will just note that with that with licensed uses, um, there's I think always got to be a synergy between the uh, licensee, the manufacturer, and the vendor that operates along all of these dimensions. And so if once receiver standards become an issue that's part of a of a conversation and that is attracting conscious engagement from all of these parties, um, then, we can, uh, th then we can expect that there, there will likely be progress as this becomes a foreground in, uh, in, in planning. And as the costs and benefits become a little bit more sharply brought into view of any particular initiative in this area. Um, to deal with your, your question specifically of, um, of illicit cell sites, this, this, is a, this is an especially tough problem because the licensed operator um, uh, the licensed operator has you know, limited awareness that an illicit cell site is operating um, without, doing, uh, without doing some very active network oversight and, and maintenance. And of course, you, know, you can be engaged in this all the time and they, then they still pop up. In fact, I've spoken to a professor who, who uh, has a class project of building a stingray, a, 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 cell, um, a cell phone um, interception fake tower. Uh, with under forty dollars of parts or ordered off component sites, so uh, so it's it's very difficult to swat this stuff down. And I'm not going to say that efforts have been inadequate so much as pointing to the uh, the continued evolution that's needed in this space, um, you know, particularly in the Washington D.C. area, where you're going to have a higher proportion of value um, per I guess megabyte of, of conversation snooped uh, than you would in some other jurisdictions, but. Uh, but I'm just, just going to point out that this is part of the ongoing security challenge here, and this is why we need to, to foreground it and enable it to become a topic of conversation rather than, getting it, uh, rather than allowing it to be subsumed in all the other churn that's constantly confronting uh, licensed spectrum operators uh, trying to get their business done. 
Commissioner, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot today as well. And I would encourage our audience to contact uh, Commissioner Simonton's office uh, with any questions, observations, uh, and particularly any uh, uh, efforts to, uh, to assist Commissioner Simonton as he uh, uh, looks at this very important topic of receiver standards and, and what can be done. Uh, it touches on a lot of parts of our economy. It touches on a lot of our uh, national security interests. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing from Commissioner Symington uh, as he makes progress in this area. Thank you very much. It has been an absolute de delight, Commissioner. And allow me to uh, allow me to uh, echo those uh, those uh, those comments. I've learned a lot today as well. I find the questions very engaging and uh, a, a real pleasure to use one. Thank you.